Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 543, that's 543, I'm pretty sure in Espanol, but maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong, is it Espanol or is it Espanolis? Whichever way around it is, you know the show, you know the guy, it's I, your host Agostino Zynga and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast is meeting you right now. If you should listen to it via the podcast app, of course, even a 54321 star review, especially on Spotify. Spotify's got a new rating system, so I would like to see some reviews on there. Let me actually check and see if I've got any reviews. I doubt I have any on there because you mofo don't listen to me. You don't listen to me, but hopefully I've got at least one review on there. I bet I have absolutely zero but let's see stranger things have happened good evening is telling me here at the start let's quickly press it bish bash bosh boom bang bing boom boom let's see if i've got one here any reviews whatsoever a zero so yeah if you could do me a favor leave me a review on spotify i'll be greatly appreciated i've got a rating system on there just leave me one it won't take long a little good review there just so people could know and see the show basically see how people are listening to it so that'd be much appreciated of course if you're watching the thing via youtube you know what to do standard procedure smash like hit subscribe all that comment stuff below that'd be greatly appreciated nice to see some comments here i'm switching up the live youtube thing i'm not going to do a premiere anymore i'm just going to drop the show some people are complaining that i basically upload the clips before the full show so i'm going to drop the full show then do the clips at the same time i'm just going to yeah, i'm just going to do them all the same time raga let's just do it all the same time let's get everything out there at the same time so you'll be seeing this a lot more often um and yeah of course patreon too uh, episodes coming out tomorrow so if you're on there you'll get that patreon episode tomorrow regarding the dash no documentary that i watched and kind of reviewed and have some thoughts on so if you want to watch that then check that out it's a bonus episode that i upload every week that one's late by one week so if you want to catch up on the rest of the stuff catch up and there'll be another one coming at the end of the week too to make up for previous week so don't worry don't worry and sign up at patreon.com for just agostino to get access to all that stuff that's patreon i guess patreon.com for slash agostino you'll find a link in the description if you can't listen to the sound of my voice because i speak too fast as other people have pointed out to me but i am the way that i am and i'm not going to change <laughs> no 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 it's difficult to slow down your speech man especially if it's tied you know what i'm thinking maybe part of my speech and reason why i speak so fast is because when i was younger i used to stutter really badly i'm sure i still do it now uh, from time to time or maybe often i don't really know because i don't really listen back to the show for the most part i find it quite cringe to hear my voice again but i did used to start like aggressively when i was younger like duh, 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 like r ridiculous like i was having a heart attack right and i think because of that usually two things happen Either you become really quiet. I've noticed when you when you develop a star when you're younger, right? Or when you have one when you're younger and you, you know, whatever. You have to navigate through life. Either you become really mute, like a super shy kind of kid where you don't really want anyone to kind of notice you're around and you kind of want to be small and whatnot. Or you turn into the guy that is like me where you just end up machine gun firing all your sentences and paragraphs because you don't want to get caught in some sort of gu 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 like buffering screen. Do you know what I mean? That's what he ends up doing. So I think that's why I've tried to kind of make up for my... Um, it's, it's basically an insecurity. That's what I'm basically trying to tell you. I'm insecure. So if I talk too fast, keep those opinions to yourself because it's an insecurity of mine. I do not want to be reminded of my insecurities. And if you care about my mental health, wink, wink, then don't mention it. No, but I'm joking. I'm, I'll try my best to try and slow it down a bit and try and be um, a little bit more... Um, understandable in the way that i speak if possible it's hard to do but you know i will try i will try um but yeah hope you're good wherever you are i'm doing fine um i've just been to you know i've just been to gym i've been to gym a few hours ago and it's hilarious already that only and again i'm recording this you know whenever doesn't matter the date but when i'm recording this it's already what only say 19 20 days into the year or into the new year and already 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 the, em the gyms are starting to empty People have given up on their news resolutions already. Or my thinking is people didn't even start them. They didn't make one. And I think that's true because I think for the last past two years or maybe, yeah, for the last two years so far, it's been the first two years of my kind of adult life where I hadn't really written a New Year's resolution down in terms of a list of stuff I was going to do. And uh, usually, if you know me, you know that I'm very kind of goal orientated. I'm really driven. I kind of do my own thing. I kind of move to the beat of my own drum. And from 
the time that I discovered self-help books and sort of like self-actualization and all that sort of nonsense, I got really into kind of writing down my goals and having vision boards and all that sort of malarkey. I was one of those kind of guys. Cringe, annoying. I know I listened to all the Tony Robbins tapes. Like I did the whole thing. I did everything. <laughs> Trust me. It's embarrassing. The amount of money I spent on that shit before I discovered what torrenting was is embarrassing. But anyway, we move. Um, <laughs> what they do for me did nothing <laughs> but anyway let's let's stay for another day let's stay for another day i'm not one of the success stories that they put in the back of the finger like you're smiling with a check like or with a car of your lamborghini nah, 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 nah. i still take the bus <laughs> and pay my counter tax sometimes late but anyway let's move on <laughs> um i was that guy so because i was that guy i've always been very diligent in terms of having some sort of new year's resolution usually i don't do new year's resolution i usually do many things throughout the year just to kind of keep me honest whereas you know sober october um i do like especially before i was running all the time i was doing like a race a month like little things that would basically provide me with the uh, with with sensible kind of guardrails so i wouldn't go too crazy because if you're doing a race every month that's basically going to mean you have to train for it right if you want to do, have a good performance which is then going to result in you maybe not going out as much maybe you sleeping a little bit earlier waking up a bit earlier all this sort of stuff right that that kind of will lead into it so i kind of did that on purpose and obviously when the new year comes always a great chance to just start again from a clean slate and just do as and you kind of hold out for as long as possible in terms of the boozing and going out and getting on it and all that sort of stuff because that can come later especially when it comes to january february there's no real need to you can always kind of do that in march april going forward there's not really anything on all the <clears throat> from what i remember sorry about that from what i remember being in offices again because i'm working from home but i remember being in offices all the birthdays and whatnot usually start around february anyway february march onwards is when the birthdays start to happen blah de, blah blah people start to leave whatever celebration is needed in terms of eating shit food and mucking around so you can basically get away with being a bit of a hermit at the beginning of the year which obviously ties in with being, it, it being easy i think to do new year's resolutions but obviously in this time that we're living in it's a bit unique obviously with the pandemic so i think people in general have basically given up being goal orientated and just got down and just kind of resorted back to just living a somewhat fulfilling life and being okay with that because if you're living a fulfilling life anyway those goals don't really matter in it because for the most part those goals are a way to you to kind of um make up for all the messed up stuff you've been doing the last year and usually the messed up stuff i found out from my experience i don't know about you i usually did it as an escape from my reality because my reality is so bleak but because of the pandemic and again a weird unintended consequence i think has led us to kind of look inwards to enjoy our own company or to enjoy the company of our close family and friends who we can meet whatever when the lockdown was you know really really harsh and it's also allowed us to basically enjoy live it like a day-to-day -day life i don't think this makes sense but i've always complained especially when i went to spain for the first time um one of the things i've noticed i was like wow man these guys know how to hang like there's a good hangout culture and we never had it here of course we don't the city's not really designed well in london for hanging out especially if you don't live in in if you don't live in a place where there's like a park or there's like a or it's like a main kind of spot like a cool spot like a dawson or whatever or like a peckham you know what i mean there's not really cool places to like hang and sit down like a nice bench most of the benches around here are like you know occupied by people who are let's say um displaced right if that's a term to put so you can't exactly hang out on benches it's not necessarily the most cosmopolitan city so it's quite hard to just hang and have a good time even though you can drink on the streets which is really weird isn't it strange how that happens that's so it's never really been a good hangout city but i think the pandemic has forced us to turn london into a good hangout city and especially when i go out these times i've been going out a few times or i've went to pirate studios to record a dj mix and i've come back home late walking whatnot i've seen a lot more people just chilling around just hanging around shooting the shit obviously you know loads of balloons tss, that kind of sound you would hear in the background but people are generally just being able to have fun without going anywhere which if you know anything about london you know that's not even that was never a vibe london fun always consisted of you spending 100 pound in the pub somewhere or a bar yeah i mean always consisted of you drinking alcohol or whatever it, this time i think people just enjoying life with their friends and whatnot so i think that's been like a kind of good in consequence so but yeah the point that's making is i think that's the reason why people have basically been a bit put off with you know resolutions because this is kind of we're living in a sort of like there's no need to have those kind of goals if anything people just want to make sure they fit into their old clothes which most people have put on a couple of pounds myself included so maybe your old clothes you wore in 2019 aren't fitting as well as they did before but 
that doesn't really take you having to go to the gym every day. Do you know what I mean? You could just fix up your diet and just stick to a pretty clean diet Monday to Friday and pick out Saturday to Sunday. And by the most and for most people, if you do that in combination with some intermittent fasting, you'll drop the pounds needed to fit into your shirt or your jacket or your jumper really easily. So that kind of lifestyle sort of change is not that hard to do. But unfortunately I found for myself the eating right or correct at home, especially when you're working from home, is far more difficult. I think the kind of hustle and bustle, that's kind of the thing you miss of working. You've got that hustle and bustle of always kind of being up at a certain time, leaving your house at a certain time, which then kind of regiments how you eat and also regiments your options of where you got to eat. And it's easy if you want to do a bit of a diet Monday to Friday, you just, you know, you do your little meal plan, you put it all on a bit of Tupperware in the fridge, maybe you plan it two or three days ahead of time. And then as you're leaving, you just pop it in your bag, you know, or before you go to bed, you pop it in your bag and boom, you're off. Um, and if you got that already at work, it's really unlikely for me personally. I always found it easier to just put the thing in my bag and go. And even if I wanted to dip in and make a bad choice, it's hard to do because you really brought food with you. So then I'll tell myself, okay, let me finish this first. And if I'm hungry, I'll get something else. So by the time you finish it, you're satisfied. You're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to cheat and mess this up. So you don't do it. So I found that a bit harder to do at home. I'm not going to lie, but yeah, it's quite funny just to see the difference between going to the gym on around the 1st of January in that kind of period, 1st to 5th, and then going to the gym now, it's completely empty. Like there's so much room. I think I was rushing as well today, thinking I was going to be late and it was going to be packed because this last thing you want to be in is in a gym packed. You have to wait because I'm not the kind of guy that likes to ask people if they're finished on the machine because I don't like people asking to me either, especially if you get there early. I think if you got there late, it's your fault, and you just have to wait for somebody to finish, and then you get on it. But this whole like, oh, when you finish, when you finish, like, relax, man. And it always, it only seems to happen on the flipping bench press. That bench press machine is honestly one of the most in demand pieces of gym equipment I've ever seen in my life, man. Especially in like hood gyms, gyms in the ends, right, where there's a plethora of like you know, normie sort of dudes there who just want to just flex their chest, lift a couple barbells, and keep it moving those dudes man they don't mess around with their with their bench press you better get off that mouth uh, quickly or they're gonna get angry so yeah so that was a bit of a mad one to see and yeah apart from that nothing else to, to ring home about united played not gonna talk about that obviously because it's boring i hate united um even though we won i hate the club i hate the team i hate everything about it and um i think for the most part our fan base is living in hope in it we're hoping that we're going to be able to turn things around and become successful in the next five years but i think nah i think it's gonna be eight at least maybe even ten before we get there and this is also um five i'm saying eight to ten hoping that the teams around us don't get any better than what they are but that's obviously not going to happen because no one stands still and waits for you to catch up so that's definitely not going to happen but yeah whatever we move in it let's move on Big news and the best news to come out, obviously, of from the last 24 hours has been this announcement courtesy of one BJ, the BJ King, right? If that's, is that a good nickname to give somebody? Probably not. It says COVID face mask rules and COVID passes to end in England. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Finally, it feels like the UK has decided to basically live with COVID. It feels like we've made a collective decision, even though I would say for the most part, if you go out to places in Shoreditch, places in New Cross, you go to Tottenham, um, you go to Notting Hill, <laughs> right? You wouldn't believe there was a pandemic. In certain places, certain hotspots, you wouldn't believe a pandemic exists because people are out in force, especially on, on a Friday, Saturday night. Everyone's out. Everyone's getting on it. Everyone's getting giddy and whatever in the streets and whatnot and just having a blast. So you wouldn't think there was a pandemic. And it's been such a culture shock to go from being in Berlin, especially before they locked down and then coming back here or you know, leaving London to go to Berlin and come back here was a mind fuck because here we don't do anything. We only wear them when you have to wear the mask. And even though I'm double jabbed in it, I just, you know, you just forget it or you don't take it with you. So the most times I've worn mine is basically when I've gone to do my like weekly shop. And even then I just forget to get it, especially if I'm going to a gym, I haven't brought it with me, but nowadays I just always leave one in my bag just in case. So that's the only time you wear it. So when I left London to go to Berlin, and then I'm going to the airport. Oh, wow, I got to wear it. And I got, had, had, had to have it on the whole day. And I was really feeling constricted. I was like, oh, damn, I forgot what it felt like to wear a mask or the whole day, actually, because you have to have it on in the airport, on the on the airplane itself. And basically, you couldn't take it off until you got back outside, basically, the, the airport terminal in Berlin. And then once you get onto the public transport there, you got to wear it too, everywhere you go. Basically, everywhere you go. Like, And 
you definitely get a lot of um group pressure is it group societal pressure because everybody on the public transport is wearing one and you kind of like have to put one on so you kind of even if you forget you quickly put it on because everyone else is having it on then to do that and then come back here to the uk was a mindfuck because everyone's looking at you like a freak when you're when you're at the station waiting for your overground and you've only one got the mask on so it's been a bit of a weird one but in general some would argue as dsp says <laughs> that we've been living without covid anywhere for the best part of what maybe it feels like three months or something more than that the only place where you feel it again is maybe when you go out to a club you have to do the whole flipping pcr thing some places which is weird some places don't even let you in some places aren't even asking for covid passes which is interesting they just favor more pcr tests most promoters it feels like if they're able to have because i think he mentions it in this article um places will be able to choose um what entry requirement they would basically need for you to you know um enter their premises and some people that i've seen for the most part some most places i've gone to they've prioritized pcr tests over vaccine passports which is interesting interesting but yeah we continue um face mask rules and covid passes to end in england it says here um england's plan b measures which is what we have at the moment which basically means you have to wear your mask in stores and whatnot sorry are set to end from next Thursday with mandatory face coverings in public places and COVID passports to both be dropped. The Prime Minister has also said the government would immediately drop its advice for people to work from home. The PM said that England was reverting to Plan A due to boosters and how people had followed Plan B measures. And if you want to hear his, his announcement, because he was really happy about how he was really happy about announcing this, by the way. So let's just hear what he had to say in real time. This morning, the Cabinet concluded that because of the extraordinary booster campaign, together with the way the public have responded to the Plan B measures, we can return to Plan A in England and allow Plan B regulations to expire. As a result, from the start of Thursday next week, mandatory certification will end. Organisations can, of course, choose to use the NHS COVID pass voluntarily, but we will end the compulsory use of COVID status certification in England. From now on, the government is no longer asking people to work from home. Yeah. And people should now speak to their employers about arrangements for returning to the office. And having looked at the data carefully, the Cabinet concluded that once regulations lapse, the government will no longer mandate the wearing of face masks anywhere. Yeah. Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, from from tomorrow, from tomorrow, we will no longer require face masks in classrooms, and the department and the Department for Education will shortly remove national guidance uh, on their use in communal areas. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing, amazing, amazing. Over the moon. Um, cannot wait. The, 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 the Prime Minister said, yeah, the mandatory passport centre and nightclubs and large events would end. The organisations could choose to use NHS COVID pass if they wished. Like I said, most places I've been to have only required you to take PCR tests, which has been somewhat well received, I think, because a lot of people that live within, or a lot of people that kind of exist within the dance, com the, the, you know, the dance music scene or the nightlife scene tend to prefer PCR tests over COVID vac over vaccines and passports because of whatever political opinion they have so that's good to see people will no longer be advised to work from home and should discuss their return to office with the employers pret a is doing flipping backflips right now so is greg's and all these places that basically don't exist or don't function as businesses unless people are able to go back and through back and forth to work especially places like liverpool street you know all those offices around that area um silicon roundabout quote unquote the old street area all those places are going to be over the moon the cafes and whatnot um having people basically go back to your office because without them those places do not function the continues your face masks will no longer be mandated though people are still advised to wear them in enclosed crowded places and when meeting strangers no one's going to wear them it british people are like that if you give us the if you if you if you tell us we don't need to do something and then advise us we can do it if we want we're not going to do it <laughs> from thursday especially if it's not, it's not illegal from thursday secondary school pupils will no longer wear, need to wear face masks in classrooms and government guidance for the usual community areas will be removed shortly i never understood the whole kid thing man from early on right when the when covid was at its it's the most severe and people were dropping dead left right and center we were told from the beginning to kind of not say factual things but two things that were super super kind of drummed into us was that hey number one kids can't get it as severely as adults can 
um obviously they're still they're still highly what's that word called they can still transmit it to other people but they can't you know it doesn't affect them it's not as fucking lethal as it may be with adults especially people that have pre-existing health conditions and number two you don't need to wear a face mask outdoors right you're you, is the chance of you catching the virus outdoors are you know for, for, are reduced a lot and for whatever reason you know roll on the whatever recent years we've kind of turned it into kids need to get vax as well and now we've kind of had kids flipping wearing face masks in classrooms and having their tables you know distance apart it's just nonsense like that whole that whole kind of um that whole kind of uh make-believe thing that we did that somehow these things were actually helping us was nonsense because for the most part we were just all lucky i think still face masks obviously have some benefit for sure but let's say prolonged you know, if you're if you're staying in the flipping supermarket for an hour and a half and people have COVID around you, you're probably going to get it anyway. But if you're quick and you're sensible about where you are and you don't loiter around and stuff, and you got a face mask, I'm sure that's going to you know reduce your chances of getting the virus. But this idea that standing two meters apart and having some perspex glass in front of you was ever going to protect you is just nonsense. Especially you know, as if like the virus can't go above the flipping thing that you're in. It's just weird. But you know, whatever, man. I'm happy anyway. I'm over the moon. So hopefully that's going to happen very soon. But if you're wondering, if you're wondering why Boris was so quick to come out and basically announce this and why he was so jubilant and why some of the people in his backbench were also wanting to be jubilant with him and kind of give him some, you know, imaginary high fives, it's because of this. Obviously, he's still in a bit of a hot seat, right, at the moment, Boris, for the flipping party that happened <laughs> under his watch. And he got grilled really aggressively here by, um, what's her name, Beth Rigsby or Beth Grisby, whatever that woman's name is from Sky's News, who is funny with her, too, because I think last year she was caught alongside with, um, what's her name, that absolute B-I-T-C-H something kelly whatever her name is that woman right and they went out for a party again last year was so weird man when it came to people breaking covid rules like people's birthday parties turned into real like make or break things like people just couldn't resist i don't know what is about people's birthday parties like i need to celebrate my birthday and this woman's like 67 years old like why do you care about your birthday that it, your birthday should not matter anymore when you're over the age of 18 i swear to god over the age of 18 no one cares about your birthday like don't invite me out don't say it's a restaurant place i don't i don't care i'll send you a text i'll let you know you know especially if i'm close to you i might even get you a gift on amazon gift card but a birthday party when you're when you're over the age of 18 is one of the most r-worded things i've ever seen in my entire life it's so immature and childish and for some reason during the height of lockdown people said people's birthdays was like the breaking point like i can't take it anymore i need to be outside for my birthday me, me, me. and then they go out and break the rules and then get caught and then start crying about it again like nonsense but anyway that aside i thought she grilled boris really really well and he was you know obviously being um the excellent orator that he is and stumbling all over his words and he came out with some absolute doozy so if you're wondering why boris was so quick to announce that we're gonna end the we're wearing a face mask we go back to plan a all this rousing speech he does because obviously his job's in the underline too and for whatever reason politicians don't you know are immune to flipping consequences so he had this party during the height of lockdown he was obviously there enjoying himself with a glass of pims and some cheese they bought from flipping waitrose um him and his new missus hanging out having a good time and you know he didn't want to fall any sword he didn't want to resign obviously still now he's still hanging on to his job like a last like dsp said like a cat hanging on to a curtain like for dear life and yeah, he f he's fighting as much as he can, but this interview was absolutely legendary. This is Sky News interviewing Boris Johnson and asking him, is he going to step down over the party's controversy? And here's his answer. Just to be clear then, you're saying that Dominic Cummins is lying and his version of events is not true. What I'm, what I'm, I just repeat, I, I, I'm deeply sorry for mistakes that were made. I know, but are you but saying that he's lying and his version of events, it's very important, viewers will want to know, the public will want to know, your MPs will want to of know. Course, of course. He is on the record saying under oath you are lying, that you were warned about this event and you went ahead <laughs> anyway, that you knew that I can it tell was, you it was dodgy. Categorically, that nobody told me and nobody, nobody said that uh, this was something that was against the rules, that was... A Yo, that line is so mad. Nobody told me this was against the rules. Mate, you make the rules. You're the leader. You're the boss. Nobody told me I couldn't do this. Like, you know what this kind of reminds you of a little bit? This is a weird example to make, but it's something that always kind of grated me. A tiny bit, tiny bit grated me. It's just me, just me. 
whenever you'd go for an interview to a, 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 like a new place that you wanted to go and work at and you'd get there and let's say your interview was at 3 p.m you rock up at let's say 2.45 you know 2.50 if you're going to be cheeky but you rock up at enough time for, for to get to the reception you know um say you're there let the receptionist then you know send a message to whoever needs to be but you're there with enough time to start your interview on time and for whatever reason it never does it always starts like five minutes later or maybe sometimes I've, I've been waiting in the reception for like 15 minutes but because of that time you're usually unemployed or you're trying to leave a place that is you know you're absolutely hating you don't notice the time but it's a little tiny thing that usually I find a little bit disrespectful right that like I, I know I don't work for you guys but at least respect my time you said 3 p.m I'm here at 3 p.m and the funny thing is if the shoe was on the other foot if no yeah or if it was the other way around and you turned up 15 minutes late they probably won't let you in the building or your chances of getting a job would decrease heavily and then the same thing needs to be said again no and then another example you know when you're at work and you you know you come in at nine and then for every reason your boss just always comes in at 9 25 9 30 9 40 sometimes 10 a.m for no reason and they always leave on time too it's not like they stay late they always leave on time that's always the thing that's kind of great me a little bit and usually is a sign of poor leadership and usually in the places i've been where that kind of happens it's not been the greatest place to work and people are kind of working you know begrudgingly the kind of people that work at those kind of places are the ones that complain about their bosses all night long when you go out for a couple of drinks that's always a bad sign too if you go out for drinks and you spend your entire time complaining about the place you work at you probably work in a toxic environment and you probably should think about leaving unless you can't leave and you've got a family and you've got to, you know put food on the table it is what it is but most places i've found if you're complaining about it the whole time when you're with your work colleagues meant to have you know downtime and relax it's not a good sign but him saying i didn't know i wasn't allowed when he's the guy making the rules is absolutely nuts absolutely nuts breach of the of the covid rules or we were doing something that wasn't a a work event because uh, frankly i don't think uh, i can't imagine why on earth it would have gone ahead or why it would have been allowed uh, to go ahead I, my, my memory of this event as i said that's is going that's how you know he's a prick because he's throwing other people under the bus when he's meant to be the leader. When you're the leader, you're meant to lead first. It's like, what's that quote? What's that book title? Great leaders eat last, right? I'm sure it's a phrase, right? I'm sure it's a saying, but it's, it's true. Great leaders eat last and you're meant to, it's like, um, it's like being the captain on a boat, right? When it's going down, you're meant to stay on board and be the last one to leave. Make sure everyone else gets off first and you're meant to go down with the ship or be the last one to leave. But this guy's basically saying, I didn't know, I didn't know, I couldn't get under one of the first boats to leave. I didn't know. I just got on there because it was there. It's like, brother. Going out into the garden for about 25 minutes for what I implicitly thought was a, uh, a work event. Uh, <laughs> and guy, talking to staff, thanking staff. Um, I, I, I can't remember exactly how many, but for about 25 minutes I was there. I then went back to my, uh, my office and continued my work. Um, you know, I, I do humbly apologize to people for uh, misjudgments that were made, but that is the, the very, very best of my recollection about this event. That's what I've, uh, I've said to, to the inquiry. We'll have to see what they, what they say. Some of your MPs that, and, and members of the public think that this is your Barnard Castle moment, that the idea that you walked into the garden, there's 40 people there, <laughs> the tables are laid out with food and drink and there's alcohol yeah. being served, in the middle of a lockdown and you think that's a work event that is just ludicrous isn't it you are just taking the mickey out of the british people by no suggesting I, well I, I, I look I, I you know how silly that sounds don't you i think what imagine rocking up to a missus or your fella or whoever you're with and saying yeah i didn't know i was walking into a brothel i didn't know i was walking into an orgy i just thought it was a work event <laughs> imagine imagine trying to get that lie off you have to be obviously you have to be somebody that's um I don't know if people even rich even make those lies because what's the point? I guess if you're rich, you won't give a shit. There's just certain lies that there's not even worth even saying because it just sounds so far fetched. But I guess when you're when you're that like when you're that kind of d divorced from consequences, because imagine when this Boris actually had to face any consequences in his life for his actions. Like he's the kind of type of person like you know in um the episode of Succession when that guy accidentally kills that boy when he's gonna go try and score drugs and he drowns in a car. His dad just sorted it out for him, right? Th things like that can just disappear because you've got money or the consequences aren't as harsh. You might get community service. You might get a slap on the wrist, a little fine. And again, so he's he just, 
I don't even think he's being dishonest. I generally think he doesn't think he did anything wrong. That's the scary part of it. People need to do is wait and see what the, the report says. But I, I repeat my, my deep apologies to people for mistakes that uh, may have been mistakes. made on my watch. And, but you see that that looks ridiculous. I, I, it sounds I, ridiculous. I, I, I repeat my apologies for any <laughs> and all misjudgments that were made. Two boozy parties held in the garden, in the buildings of Number 10, the night before Prince Philip's funeral, when the country was in national mourning, <laughs> was having to apologise to the Queen about those parties the night before she put her husband of over 70 years, she laid him to <laughs> rest. Was that humble. a moment of shame for you? I, I, I deeply and, and bitterly regret uh, that, 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 that that happened. And I can only uh, you know, and renew my apologies both to... Uh, to Her Majesty and uh, to the country. Ah, oh, fuck that. A little tiny thing again. It's not a big deal, but come on, man. Like, this guy's a mess. He can't even put on a face mask properly. Like, it's going over one of his earlobes. Like, pfft. sometimes it makes you question your ambition in life, innit? Or question your career choices. Because you look at these people and you're like, honestly, legitimately, like, if you weren't born where you were born and you weren't born into the family you were born into, the time that you were born, like, could he ever get this job if you were just a regular dude? Impossible, right? Impossible, impossible, impossible. Like, forget the dumb dumbness, just the lack of, like, he doesn't inspire any confidence. What kind of leader is he? Like, again, the, it's one thing he did a mistake. Of course, you know, you're in the garden, you do the whole party thing, cool. I think most people broke the rules in some way, shape or form, but it's the way that they tried to like scare everybody not to go outside they were finding people i remember 15 videos of them dragging g manners out of their gyms and arresting them and giving them fines and stuff for having gyms open to keep people fit and healthy and these guys were sat around you know in their flipping suits that are exploding you know their moss bro suits eating flipping mns flipping cheese boards and shit and drinking what um what do you call it alco pops and rosé, because you know he's a rosé drinker, isn't it? You know he drinks rosé or chardonnay or something, or some nonsense. You know, having a couple of grapes, talking about whatever he saw on TV. Whilst we were the ones that were kind of on punishment, so-and-so, looking over our shoulders, making sure they weren't police around the corner. <sighs> Hate them, man. Hate them. But anyway, let's move on. Um, news regarding streetwear stuff. Some good, 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 good good news so this is courtesy of wwd the louis vuitton and nike collaborations designed by virgil abloh on the air force one are due to come out soon it feels like there's loads of um i've seen loads of leaks not leaks no i've seen loads of people sharing pictures of their pairs i've seen some leaks of people that obviously work in the sneak industry getting samples and showing them off too and that's usually the standard sort of protocol for the drumming up and the, as we approach kind of the release date of the actual shoe itself um now he basically seeds them to the people that matter quote unquote and then obviously all the sneaker heads get a pair or two the news platforms and whatnot and they share some pictures and then little by little they'll probably start to come out in some sort of gr way not really gr because i don't think you or i are going to be able to get a pair of these anytime soon but still in terms of his legacy in terms of just being a great way to sort of i think punctuate some yeah some sort of punctuation of virgil's basically um stamp on sneaker history on sneaker culture in general and obviously his work is done with nike i think this is a great way to do it by bringing these two forces together and basically presenting in a shoe basically a collaboration between virgil nike and louis vuitton um done in the best way possible really especially taking inspiration from all the bootleg stuff that people used to sell back in the day but to be honest when i got my first bootleg pair of designer air force ones it was i think via meteor sports and if i'm not mistaken meteor sports used to buy legit pair of air force ones and then they used to get legit the, the, the idea of the thinking was they'd get legit bags or fabric of Gucci or Louis and then cut the swoosh and then stick that over the actual swoosh itself. Sometimes they'll stick it. Other places would remove the actual swoosh to have it a bit more flush and have the actual fabric swoosh placed on there. But they were a standard thing that you would buy. And sometimes, of course, you do the whole spray paint, the air spray, air paint. Is it, how, how do you call that? Is this spray paint? Yeah, I think that they do back in the day in hip hop in the 80s and whatnot they do that stuff on there too i knew i remember wiley having a really sick pair of um, air force ones done that way that i remember seeing in meteor sports i think he he 
I think he either made them or they were made for him and they were presented in some sort of box. I remember seeing them there back in the day. And Meteor Sports, in case you're wondering, was this um, legendary sneaker store in Shepherd's Bush, if I'm not mistaken, or Labrador Grove, I forgot what the area was, Labrador Grove, um, that used to sell basically one of the first kind of reselling spots before fakes arrived. Because I think now that there's so many fakes, a lot of these reselling spots just sell fakes. They don't resell really legit stuff. I'm pretty sure of it especially the ones around my area there's no way these guys have paris dunks and whatnot like come on let's be real so before fakes existed or before fakes were as good as they are now because fakes are basically one-on-one -on -one, most of them if you can get good ones but back in the day if you wanted to get you know limited edition shoes and you didn't mind paying the money you could either go to a place like slamming kicks in central london which was more catered around people that were in the know or you could go to hood spots like meteor sports and pick up bits and pieces and sometimes they wouldn't be that knowledgeable and they maybe price them a bit low i remember buying a pair of atmos air max ones from there um for really low like for maybe i don't know 200 pounds or something stupid and the reason why they were that cheap if i remember correctly one shoe was a display shoe so it was a bit more yellowed or discolored than the other shoe but still crazy bargains but yeah the legacy of this shoe or the inspiration from it is really really deep deep in his sneaker culture deep in history you could say maybe those louis vuitton things um with the gucci swooshes the louis vuitton print um whatever else they put they put burberry all these sort of things they might have been maybe the first sort of custom shoes you know people now do a lot of custom sneaker designing and painting or stuff and changing panels to alligator skin that might be in some of the first forays into it i think so if i'm not mistaken obviously people did markers on there i know people back in the day used to swap the laces of their adidas superstars and put those really thick laces that the guys from run dmc used to wear or to remove the laces completely but for the most part in terms of really like cutting and pasting stuff and changing the way it looks those swooshes might have been some of the first forays into it and i remember her and preston actually did a really good um, project on that recently too with these shoes called the street sweeper which is a good little mix-up where he basically got an air force one mid and he took off the nike swoosh and then replaced it with a louis vuitton um babe star sort of uh, moniker on the side that you get on a babes shoe which was quite cool so that was a good little mix up a kind of an unofficial um collab hybrid thing which is interesting to see if they actually end up doing that in real life because they probably will much later on and it'll probably be horrible compared to what harem did but yeah continue exclusive louis vuitton and nike air force one by a vegetable below sneaker to launch with an auction obviously because you know when it comes to releasing shoes especially limited edition shoes they always get given to the rich and famous first before they get given to UI. That's just standard protocol. It's annoying. It's frustrating. I still, I'm still annoyed the fact that we have to enter fucking raffles to win a chance to buy shoes. You know, the, the whole I, you know, sneaker culture has basically changed the meaning of what a raffle is. Like I've said many times, a raffle is when I've grown up, especially when you go to a fun fair. The whole point of a raffle is that you buy a ticket for a nominal fee, and it gives you the chance to win something incredibly you know more expensive than what the raffle ticket was so if you bought a raffle ticket for a quid you might have the chance to win a football that might be 10 pounds or you might have a chance to win a fridge to win a hat to win a pass to the flipping fair itself for a year whatever it'll be something you'd, you'd get more out of the ticket than what you paid for it now a raffle means you get the opportunity to buy some shoes that are really expensive <laughs> <laughs> and they that they purposely made in limited numbers to basically you know enforce some sort of artificial scarcity they don't need to sell these only in lv and auction these off they could just make enough to give to people to, to buy them in store as a great way to say virgil's legacy that he wanted everyone to rock these here's an opportunity to do so here's the stores you can buy an iphone for again ps places is a good example yes all the resellers keep buying them up but they still do keep dropping Yes, you have to be quick to buy them, but you still can get a console if you're smart enough or not smart. If you've got the right connections and you've, you know, you've got the right bookmark save, you can basically get a console if you want to. But you just have to, you know, have your kind of finger on a pulse. But with these, they drop once. And if you miss it, that's it. There's no other chance to get them again unless you're going to go on StockX or go and pay exorbitant resale prices there or eBay. I, I dread to think what these are going to go for because already they're going on auction this pair only that's going to be limited to louis vuitton customers i would imagine of vip customers i can't imagine what they're going to go for on ebay i can't imagine i can't imagine but let's continue 
Louis Vuitton will launch its eagerly awaited Air Force One sneaker designed by a col- in collaboration with Nike in an auction to benefit the late designer Virgil Abloh's scholarship fund for the black fashion students, marking the first of a string of related initiatives scheduled to take place this year. Amazing to see. All that money is going to go to a black scholarship fund for black fashion creators. It's awesome. To think as well, this came off the back of, if I'm not mistaken, that whole controversy regarding the, 50, the $5 or $50 uh, donation that he gave during the whole George Floyd protest source. I think so, if I'm not mistaken. The fund came off the back of that. And now look, it came it came in a moment of, let's say, quote unquote, shame or controversy. But it's now the legacy of that fund. It's going to be, no one's going to remember that, but everyone's going to remember the fact that he even set it up as a way to kind of answer back to his critics and basically prove that he's a good hearted dude. Because I still think it was a little bit OTT, the reaction. But still he did it. And now this fund is going to basically support and provide people you know that want to make a career in fashion or in the creative fields with the opportunity to do so and they're going to go and impact many different people going on in, in the future it's just it's just amazing to see how that one fund is going to be able to touch so many people later on down the line it's amazing Abla who died of cancer in november at the age of 41 unveiled the shoes last january um last june so as part of his spring 22 in line for the french luxury house man he did so much in that last couple of years and r.i.p to the goat man all right, Peter the Goat. Um, Vuitton plans to present his full 2022 collection, which Louis Vuitton chairman and chief executive officer Marco Burke said was 95% completed at the time of designers passing in two shows on Thursday as part of the Paris Fashion Week for the men's fashion collection. Okay, so that's the last show he's doing. So that show coming up is the last Virgil Design Louis Vuitton show. So I'm sure by then, or I, I'm sure already they've probably sounded out the person that they want to replace him. I'm not sure who it's going to be. I'm not sure if they're going to go for another black designer. Will they give it to a committee of people? Will it just go in-house? Will it just drop to somebody that worked beneath, underneath Virgil? I don't know. But I'm interested to see who it does um, going forward. Um, 200 pairs of limited edition Louis Vuitton and Nike Air Force One by Virgil Abloh sneakers will go on sale through Savabees.com with proceeds going to Virgil Abloh's Postmodern Scholarship Fund, which he launched in 2020 with the initial endowment of 1 million. Louis Vuitton, Nike and Savabees said on Wednesday in a joint statement provided exclusively to WWD. Man, it's mad, isn't it? He knew what he was going through at that time. Got all those pelters, still set up that fund. Oh, man. They don't make guys like that anymore, bro. Um, the sneakers in the online auction set to run from Jan 26th to Feb 8th will be made available in an exclusive colorway and a range of sizes from 5 to 18. They're making them to size 18 with bid start. I did, you know what usually happens? It's funny. When it comes to sneakers, I don't know if you guys know, but when it comes to reselling, usually you usually buy the sizes, from my experience, from size US 8 to sometimes US 12. Those are usually the, the sizes that sell the best, right? Um, and me being a US 10, I'm usually fine in terms of getting my size and also being able to move them on if I don't like them or to get a bit of money from Brooke. But usually the sizes that are the smallest in a 5 or 3 or whatever and the sizes that are the biggest, 13 plus, they usually don't move because you know no one can shift them because you don't want that in your collection because it's too big and also not a lot of people are those sizes so they end up being far cheaper they end up being they end up selling for far less or being on sale for far less than the the hot sizes are like for instance if i look at a mars yard that i've got now that i wear to the gym i'm sure my size is way more expensive than a size seven or size six because not many people are size or sizes so i think it's going to be the actual opposite of this i think if anything those bigger sizes are going to be way way more expensive because people are going to do people are going to think no one's going to buy them everyone else is going to buy it because they just want them to have in a collection because this isn't the sh- this isn't especially in, in the wake of virgil's passing this isn't just a sneaker anymore it's a it's basically a, a memento right it's basically a piece of history that you're owning um something that probably won't happen again if you think about it like louis vuitton officially collaborating with nike especially in this freeway what in this freeway sort of deal i think they only would have done it with virgil because he was known um to be a basically a serial collaborator um he loved to basically you know uh, combine the high and the low so it made a lot more sense obviously he did really well with nike in terms of the nike 10 project so he earned a lot of kudos and a lot of kind of bargaining um chip points in that regard and i'm sure Virg- the v- louis vuitton people loved, loved him too so this made it easy i don't really see this collaboration happening too often um as much as it probably should do but yeah we continue Featuring the Vuitton signature monogram and Damia pants, uh, the Mia pattern, sorry, with natural cowhide piping. The actual, the limited edition ones that you can't get are flipping beautiful though, right? The piping, the actual Louis Vuitton leather. 
um, these are probably going to feel amazing on. The only thing I'd say is that I remember last time, I, I don't know when it was, when I used to probably work at Nike, I got a pair of super, uh, yeah, I think I might have got a pair of tier zero, or sorry, tier one, the tier zero, tier, whatever that tier is, tier zero um, Air Force Ones that were made of really good leather. The only bad thing about them, because Air Force Ones are already heavy, these things were like bricks with the actual good leather on them, which is funny. So if you buy the ones from JD Sports, they kind of crease up really quickly, but you can wear them straight away. The ones that are actually made of good leather, they hurt your feet and they're really heavy. So keep that in mind if you're actually going to wear them, which I doubt people are going to wear, but I would. If I got these, I would wear them every day, just, just as a tribute. Each pair will be sold with Louis Vuitton pilot case in monogram embossed leather with a 3D tag in orange um, to coincide with the sale, the shoes and the sneaker trunk, which is also exclusive to the auction, will be exhibited in the lobby of Subbies in New York and Wednesday to Feb 8th. The event will precede the commercial launch of the Louis Vuitton Nike via Virgil, which will be available in limited quantities and exclusively through the Louis Vuitton store network, the company said. So you're not even going to get them if you're a fan of Nike. You can only get them if you're a Louis Vuitton fan or you're a customer there, because I'm sure the first set will be sold to VIP customers, which I'm not that, I, I, I don't mind. I think that luxury um, fashion thing where they reward customers who spend a lot of money in their shop by giving them, you know, little coin pouches and and wallets and little handkerchiefs or maybe inviting them to a show. I think that's pretty cool. I love that because you don't get that from streetwear stores. Streetwear stores are notoriously tight. They probably won't even tell you something's dropping. Even if you spend, you know, a thousand pound every season, they probably won't tell you something's coming in. They'll still be sneaky and, you know, keep being secretive and all this malarkey. They, they don't really try and hook you up in, in any way, shape or form. Again, I'm not asking for discounts. Just hook, 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 hook a man up. They won't do it. Whereas these luxury, luxury stores, which sell items far, you know, at a far higher price point than streetwear stores do, are willing to give a guy a coin, you know, a coin holder, a belt, or whatever for spending loads of money in the shop or maybe give them the heads up oh yeah this new stuff's coming in if you guess you want it put your name down for this like little things like that they go a long way to do it. and again what does that do it just builds loyalty it builds trust um it builds a connection and people will just stick by you because you know you usually do right by them um but yeah streetwear streetwear people don't know that concept they just want to sell you expensive shit um that's made crappily but yeah we can we talk about that later um ablo the founder of luxury streetwear brand off-white and artistic director of men's where Louis Vuitton was involved in early organization of the auction and surrounding events. Wow, the auction will take place associated with his family. Wow, awesome. Well, more good dude, man. Um, born in Rockford, the third guy named parents are survived by his wife, Shannon, his children, Lo and Gray, his sister, Edwina, and his parents, Ni and, and Eunice. Herblow uh, designed 47 pairs of, of the NRK Fon sneaker for the spring show, bringing together the two biggest brands and partners. Vuitton said it plans to stage an exhibition for all the designs, made a shoemaking workshop in Italy, which details to reveal to a later date. Oh, so that's cool. So we'll probably get to see loads of illustrations and text messages and WhatsApp and whatnot of the design process. Um, so it seems like not all the shoes are going to come out, the ones that we saw in the show, and when you're obviously still around, we're not going to see what those shoes um, actually brought to retail, unfortunately. I'm sure a lot of the Chinese factories are going to sell them anyway, so that should be good in terms of if you want to actually get a hold of them. Because I think as well, Virgil would have, Virgil would have encouraged people to buy reps from flipping China anyway, because he was all about allowing people to basically take you know, his ideas and basically interpret them in their own way because he did the same thing with his brand. Um, so that would be quite cool to see people basically you know, getting shoes from China and stuff and editing them and maybe marking them up and writing messages and shit and sharing them. It'd be a great way to honor his legacy because those shoes will just live on, you know, uh, until the end of time, especially, like I said, I don't think we're going to see a collaboration like this ever again. In the notes of the collection revealed in the film called Amen Break, the brand said the partnership was inspired by the cover of 1988 album It Takes Two by hip-hop duo Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock. It shows Easy Rock wearing a Nike Force One basketball sneaker altered with shoes adorned with an LV monogram. The cover, it says, embodied the hip-hop community's early practice of hacking together high fashion and sportswear, sidelining divergent brands with uh, equal reverence, a cultural symbol in its own right. Today, Nike Force One serves as an object, the art, embellic, so it Emblem emblematic of self-generated subculture provenance. Um, provenance, Vuitton said at the time, to distinguish them from the original Air Force One, the sneakers were made with materials employed in Vabla's Louis Vuitton collection, were styled with, with quote marks, a signature off-white, which is highly successful coverage with Nike. In the style of uh, Sauvignon's auction, features the word air written on the sole and French word lacet on the laces. And um, from Wednesday, in the lead-up of the auction, select individuals who inspired Abloh and the Clovis will receive pairs and exclusive colorways that will not be commercialized. Okay, so everyone I've seen that's got the pair 
there is people that he picked out to get them ahead of time which is nice because that's like a little last message that he's basically left these people like a little tome it's kind of essentially like a way way to say sort of you kind of getting a, a, a an urn from him right and like a little okay cool his hand, i'll commemorate you so that's been pretty cool to see people getting those things and i'm sure people are quick to share them because they will want to show you know, i was his friend and i'm still you know i'm sure most of it is done with in earnest ways but still part of me is like yeah you're obviously going to show it off because you want everyone to know that you're a big wig in it big boy um so the ablo has established a long-term partnership with fashion scholarship fund to launch a scholarship which was endowed with a personal donation the designer and matching funds from partners the um, evian farfetch louis vuitton and new guards group and nike it supports education and academical promising students of black african or uh, black sorry african-american and our african descent as a black designer he says I found my way through school and make sure of creative projects and I had to make a name for myself that I looked that that took a lot of years and a lot of meetings and a lot of runway shows a lot of work and I wanted to make the door open for younger generation to sort of have the pathway that stays open I was a student on the campus that was largely not diverse as the world is and it's important to set up these foundations specifically for black students who may feel like the industry of fashion they don't see many people that they can identify with Ablo said he named the fund postmodern because the receipts the recipient so it would also have access to career support services and mentoring so yeah absolutely phenomenal stuff cannot wait to see it in real life um yeah as this person said if you're not going to spend 100k a year if you haven't spent 100k a year at louis vuitton don't bother because for sure these are going to be made available to vip can um, clients which again i don't have an issue with i think it's quite cool that they have this option available for people i um, mean these stores that obviously spend a lot of money there's some obviously more pictures here of the shoe itself go away i don't look take away ad block but yeah they're absolutely beautiful you can tell that these are a level above regular air force ones you get even the air force ones you got from other collaborators like they really went crazy with the leather man like god damn this looks good really 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 good i love everything about it man so yeah so big up these shoes what's this video what's this one to so all the ladies in the place which okay don't spare that because i'm gonna get ad blocked but yeah um soon come obviously if you've got money and you want to go to Sotheby's and get them yourself do so but yeah for the rest of us we're probably never going to get a chance to own them retail in my opinion i don't think it's going to happen so if you best best to get them is obviously get get reps um virgil will be happy for you to buy a rep don't worry um he was one that kind of wanted to empower people to basically have access to things that you know he probably never had access to coming up and also he wanted everybody to wear his thing so this is the best way to wear him in that regard but yeah r.i.p to the great virgil these look absolutely amazing cannot wait to see them adorned by the public when they do end up coming out um next on the fashion tip to continue on the streetwear vibe streetwear vibe streetwear vibe we got this news courtesy of vogue business bali named rude designer first creative director in five years big up rugi big up rugi big up rugi this is i've said the other day on twitter this is confirmation in case you needed it that streetwear is the most dominant um force and the most important force especially when it comes to men fashion at the moment no one's testing the guys coming from streetwear from what Heron Preston did with Calvin Klein, obviously Virgil at Louis Vuitton, Matthew Williams at Givenchy, and obviously running his brand Alix. You've got um, Luke and Lucy, I think from um, OAM, OA, um, from OAMC, who are now heading up Jill Sander, who were formerly designed as a Supreme. Um, who else you got? You got Jerry Lorenzo working with Zegna. Uh, who else have you got out there? You got obviously a Samuel Samuel Ross doing a Cold War. All these people are sort of birthed from the school of streetwear or are from that world and have gone obviously to do other things but that world has basically um has basically the birthing crown the school for all these amazing designers who have basically gone and impacted fashion at the highest level even someone like Demna you could say from being traditionally trained in fashion and obviously working under the tutelage of Mason Margiela and obviously Louis Vuitton but he still has that aesthetic that kind of feel that touch that sort of sensibility that comes from streetwear with the hoodies with the jeans with the snapback hats with the t-shirts with the sneakers it's all streetwear adjacent it's all streetwear related and i think this is confirmation if ever that you needed it that the most important designers in menswear specifically are coming from streetwear no other place traditional sort of fashion doesn't really matter they mostly are coming from that streetwear sensibility and it's taking over man 
this guy, like I said before on Twitter, like, you know, he was designing flipping cigarette shirts and pouches and stuff and, you know, like doing that sort of thing. Very California-esque Americana way, you'd say, right? A, a, a bit, it's a very particular vision, but it's also a very particular style, something that you wouldn't think a a kind of um, story brand like Bayou would want to kind of, you know, tap into. So it Bali, Bali, Bai, Bai. I, was, I keep saying Bai because a play for Man United is called Eric Bai, similar sort of spelling. But yeah, Bali, he's absolutely smashing it. So big up him. And he's only 29 or something as well. So it's absolutely nuts that he's been able to go from screen printing t shirts to now working, you know, with an actual legitimate fashion brand and presenting stuff at Paris, Paris Fashion Week, obviously coming up, I'm assuming. Um, just an amazing achievement, man. Big up this guy. Big up, big up, big up. Even though he did kind of big time me. Back in the day when I was, you know, putting together an online shoot rent course for a company that I used to work for, I did meet him briefly in LA, I think it might have been, or maybe it was Berlin for like some streetwear trade show. I forgot where it was, somewhere in the world. I went um, for that trip, which was great. That's again, one of the best jobs I had, but also one of the worst. But, you know, we move. <laughs> so if you know, you know, uh, I think I bumped into him and I went to get him on the course. And, you know, at the time, at the time, as well, to be fair to him, at the time, Virgil was obviously not the most well-liked guy in streetwear or fashion in general. And I think he didn't wasn't comfortable either being the head of this course. He wasn't comfortable ever. And he kind of made it difficult to work with at the beginning. Afterwards, we kind of got on a lot more, a lot better towards the end. But maybe I think because of that, other people too that wanted to get involved didn't want to get involved because they felt like Virgil's name wasn't the best thing to be associated which is funny because honestly this has happened i'm i'm not going to name names but there were many people who later came out when virgil passed and were like mourning his loss say how important he was in streetwear blah 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 they were the people that were giving me no's or writing very stern email replies back or basically ghosting me completely when i was reaching out about them joining as mentors to basically join in on this course that virgil's putting together they didn't want any parts of it whatsoever so it's funny that these guys are now turning around and you know pretending that there was the guy's biggest support was it's like it's like his friends i mean all the friends that hang around with him that were or no some of the friends but some people you see online that were kind of you know mourning aloud and stuff are the same people that you know they, you never saw them wearing any of the clothes that he makes <laughs> so it's like what uh but yeah that's a story for another day but name um the point remains he did kind of big time me when i did ask him to be on a course but you know i get it i think at the time he must have been what if he's 29 now he must have been like 27 26 running a massive brand like that having someone like me trying to you know beg hey can you come on the course so i i can't i can't blame people for getting i can't blame people when they big time you get and when you get a bit of context and you figure okay he was 27 he's just running his brand he's like i get it i get it i think if i was that age too i'd be gassed i'll be gassed so it continues here it says Swiss luxury brand Bali has named 29 year old Rue designer Ru, uh, Ruigi how do you pronounce his name? Ruigi Villas Noir. Is he Filipino? I'm sure he is, right? Is he Filipino or is he or is he not? I don't know. Who knows? Um, Creative director is part of the new repositioning for the 171 year old label. God damn. They need some help, man. Um, the signing of the brand's first creative director in five years was announced by the board and chairman Manuel Martinez in a statement on Tuesday. The is owned by JB and Holdings, a German investment firm of the Ryman family. You know what? Who is the Ryman family? Let's see who the Ryman family is. I don't know who they are. Are they like a well known uh, German family or what? German, German moves. It's who are the Ryman family? Okay, that's what they look like. So if you see this guy in your store, whoa. What, daddy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's move on. 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 Let's scrap. Let's scrap that. Anyway, <laughs> Villasano is currently the founder and creative director of Rude, a luxury street label launched in LA in 2015 with a core Gen Z following. Villasano, Villasano, Villasano. Yes, how you pronounce his name right? Journey from making t-shirts and hoodies as a child in San Fernando Valley to holding a place in Paris Fashion Week. Men's schedule this week has built him a loyal celeb following, including Sweetie, um, Sin Nevar. Who the hell is that? Cynthia Ivraniro, French Montana. Collaborations with brands such as Puma to McLaren have followed. Awesome. Um, You know what's interesting, actually? I'm thinking about it. The great thing about this link up and a great thing about him getting his job similar to when matthew williams got his Givenchy job and i see a lot of people poo-pooing oh, i it should have been. even this i saw people online saying oh it should have been martin rose it should have been this should have been that it's like 
you guys will never be happy with. But anyway, I'm happy for streetwear because I think streetwear gets so rubbed out by people in fashion that they kind of look down upon it. Like, oh, I remember one time when Demler was doing his thing at Vetemar and maybe Virgil was still popping up and kind of coming up. I remember watching Show Studio once, the original haters. Show Studio are full of haters, right? especially when they have the panels with flipping industry people. They don't buy any of the expensive stuff they talk about. They just hate everything because it's not flipping, you know, peak Mar Maison Margiela. It's like things have moved on. Like, start celebrating the people coming up. Like, give them their flowers. But I remember once they were doing some show, and they'll think, you know, I think it was maybe towards the end. Maybe it was the the, the collection where flipping the DHL shirt was there, right? I think that was when that caused a lot of controversy. And you know, that panel obviously went into a meltdown. Uh, DHL t-shirt is not fashion. It's not luxury. Shut up. And I remember one of them saying, kind of like, you know, snarkily, "Oh, I can't wait until tailoring makes a comeback." And to me, it felt like again, it's dumb to say. But it did feel like a bit of a dog whistle, like tailoring. What you want tailoring to come back? Why? So you can get rid of the flipping darkies. You can get rid of the flipping, you know, Hispanic people, the Asians, the people coming up and basically because that's the only way we can make it. We can get into that flipping hallowed, especially when it comes to Paris Fashion Week. Those calendars to get into that infrastructure to use their resources, their production, all this sort of stuff. How else are you going to get there? You have to just make it happen with your little cut and sew, your little screen printing, your little heat press, all this sort of stuff, iron ons, and then maybe you can build your web to get to that place to obviously enter in. And when people are saying, oh, I can't wait for Taylor in to make a comeback. Yeah, because you want to get us out there. You don't want anyone that does not look like you out of there. And also you want people in there that have the traditional fashion experience. But much like what Matthew Williams has done at Givenchy, it's been less that it's been less to do with the quality of the work i feel like and more so with invigorating with that brand with new with new blood with new energy and basically people talk about it again again it's handy that matthew williams is really talented and good at what he does because i still think he's like a really 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 high level um what would you say product person like he makes really good hardware he's obviously his accessories are amazing the shoes are great um, I think the jackets are out of this world. Maybe the overall looks are a bit whatever, but I think the, there are pieces in there that every collection that you'd want to buy, let's not deny that. And he's obviously got that um, thing where he's got his finger on a pulse and able to kind of tap into what people want at the time, bloody blah, 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 blah. So I think with these brands, they just want to be culturally relevant. Yes, the work needs to be good too, but mostly they just want to be in a conversation. They want to, they want have, they want people to talk about the show. They want the show to be viral. They want there to be content around it for him to invite his star-studded guests. Imagine, I think one of the campaigns for Rude, he had Future on it. Imagine Future opens a show for one of his collections, or Metro Brumin producing the score. All these sort of things are things to make it culturally relevant. Because now, at the moment, to be culturally relevant, you have to be uh, of from the culture. You have to. Be basically have some sort of um fan base or a following already and you know he's already got a following of rude who people are going to follow him they're going to want to follow his journey it's going to be amazing it's really really going to be amazing and he's really and again from one of the from what i've seen on social from afar he seems to be one of the small group of designers and brand owners who's really kind of um, on it when it comes to his media he's always replying to people he's sharing tweets or uploading it. i mean he's kind of he's, he's part of the you know he's in the he, he's part of gen z he is a gen z person do you know what i mean i'd imagine so i don't know if he's gen z but regardless um it's a great look man amazing for him the own design originally from manila which is Filipino, I'm pretty sure, will oversee artistic direction across um, the brand as it moves to boost relevance and accelerate growth, led by CEO Nicholas Giretto, um, who joined in 2014. Villasuna, first collection for Bali, known for its Swiss quality and craftsmanship and leather goods, including men's former shoes, will be debuting on the 2023 seasons. The last creative director, Pablo Capello, oversaw the direction of the brand in 2024 and 2017, but his designs have since been led by heads of footwear accessories and razor wear if i'm not mistaken if i'm not mistaken because i remember last time just being curious and going on a deep dive because i'm a flipping demna fanboy and i love everything about him balenciaga Vetema, all that kind of scene this dude pablo coppolo um i'm pretty sure he's at balenciaga now so he left bali to go to balenciaga and i'm pretty sure he does leather goods um so he might have been the guy that did all the hacking gucci uh, Balenciaga stuff and bags and whatnot, so that's pretty cool little tie-in. Do you know what I mean? Weirdly enough, right? There's some distance obviously in between them because he left in 2017, but still, it seems like they're somewhat plugged. They're somewhat clued in. I wonder who. I wonder if this is a headhunting thing. I wonder if they headhunted him and picked him out as someone that could maybe lead them um, into the future, or if it was something that they had open and let people apply, or if there was a shortlist of people. I wonder. I wonder. Um, 
Buy does not disclose annual sales. In the past two years, Grotto has been leading the digital transformation for the brand, which includes redesigning e commerce and launching on Tmall and WeChat in China. I'm proud. Wow, man, it's a big job in it. You forget all, you forget that side of things in it when it comes to Far East, when it comes to Asia, when it comes to what, that whole section of the world where they are just crazy about fashion and they spend money and also it's very um region specific so you have to also use wechat bebo all these sort of platforms that are only obviously specific in that area they have to kind of tap into too so it's a massive job um i'm proud to be appointed as a new creative director as a brand it's very dear to my heart has been worn in my family from generation to generation from grandma to myself said this were in the current in the thing okay cool um but yeah let's see man I'm I'm excited to see what he's going to do. I think he's going to absolutely smash it personally for me. Uh, let's get rid of this. <laughs> um, and I was looking actually at at previous collections. I think from here, right, 2017, and just overlooking on some of the cover images. And it doesn't really have a lot to work with from this or from the recent years. And I think you know it's going to be a stark contrast to what was available here in terms of the look and the feel. Um, let's see, 2017 was this, right? So this might have been one of Pablo's last collections. But he's got a good platform to basically work and basically do his thing, I think, in that regard. But let's see. I think this might have been his last collection. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, baby, Pablo uh, started getting his head. Yeah, cool. So let's see what Pablo did. In Pablo Coppolo did in his last collection. One of his last collections when he before he left. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Rugi can do a good job there, man. He doesn't, you know, again, it's, don't get me wrong. It's all well-designed clothes. It all looks really cool. But for the most part, he's going to be able to smash this out of, out of the park, man. Let's not deny that. So, yeah, big him up, man. Big him up. Um, happy for the dude. Again, another win for streetwear. And so inspiring for kids coming up to know that you can go from designing cigarette shirts and having a streetwear brand, evolving it into a kind of ready-to-wear fashion brand, having it basically show in Paris, having showrooms over there, you know, rubbing shoulders with all the right people and then just doing it in a real slow, methodical way to the point where you get headhunted by a brand like that to do your thing. Amazing. Hopefully he keeps doing both things at the same time. He's young enough to do it. I think, you know, I think he's a hard worker and obviously he likes to graft. So I'm sure he'll be able to do both in the same time because I feel like his brand route <clears throat> will actually get better from the experience that he's had, that he's going to have with this luxury brand. I think so. Same way that we're seeing now, I mentioned before, I feel like Matthew Williams, Alex is far better now than it was previously because he's got this experience of working with a fashion, with luxury fashion house, having the access to all the resources they have access to, the way of working, maybe his abilities have been fine-tuned, he's discovering different talents, maybe shortcomings that he needs some help with, blah, 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 blah. So I'm sure Rude will actually improve. So if you're a Rude customer, don't be sad because I think your products that you buy from them will actually get better over the years. So yeah, big him up, big him up. Nice to see another win for streetwear, the most important force in fashion overall, but definitely, taking over menswear like a big 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 way if you're in st martin's now studying menswear in a conventional sense switch it study streetwear join a course somewhere online whatever star brand whatever maybe because that's actually the best way to get into those hallowed walls of these luxury fashion houses than learning you know the old tired methods from all these fashion institutions that are very rigid you know be free screen print a shirt cut something out stick it on there put it there whatever it may be and you know you never know where you may be you could be the next matthew williams you could be the next virgil you can be the next heron preston there's so many opportunities for you out there so definitely if you're a young designer looking to make a way out there then definitely i would say take a peek into street where there's many many opportunities for you there moving on from there we obviously have to talk about streetwear stuff a cold war presented their for 2022 menswear collection and again i just think if this is if there's ever been an example of a brand that needed a bit of money just to elevate and refine what they already have have been doing it's a cold war 100 percent and i didn't have any doubt as soon as it got announced that sam uh, sammy ross and the cold war were getting some extra funding it was never like okay the brand's gonna die because you know the guy's a flipping assassin in terms of business and how he kind of operates the brand he's like he's a weird one because he he's he's young right but he's basically got an old head on his shoulders and he seems to treat fashioning 
design and all this sort of thing with a real cold calculated laser vision like he clearly has his life sort of like you know planned out maybe in 5 10 20 year increments he's kind of gearing up to maybe many milestones along the way and he's just kind of doing everything in his power to basically work towards that it's freaky to see to be honest so for sure i have no doubt that a cold war will probably end up being like the uk version of flipping armani i think so personally for me i see him presenting shows and you know walking at the end of the show in his in his late 70s easy and having an absolute behemoth of a brand that's you know stores everywhere like i can just see it it's clear the guys are flipping assassin and it's obviously clear now because you know in a scope of what the brand generates i'm assuming it was only a small investment right not donald trump like small million but you know what i mean small investment and look what everybody is doing look how much cleaner and refined and elevated still having the core of what a cold war is about the brand has now it just looks amazing it really really does um so big up um what they're doing over there and their entire team and what they're presenting because it just looks so good like, everything looks amazingly wearable um straight away obviously there's the reintroduction of another pair of dr martins now they've basically taken the zip sort of model that they had under 1461 i think it was is it 1461 is that, if i'm not mistaken and they've now adopted it into the 1460s so the highs um still in the gray color which i think is one of the best sort of iterations of that it's obviously one thing to do them in the black but i think that gray that's sort of like um granite gray kind of harkening back again to the you know the core of what a cold war is about is really nice the kid here with a mullet again i think i mentioned on twitter as well these body vest gillet things that a cold will do may, might be one of his most and what might be one of their most underrated pieces overall collection after collection they do a, a really mean body vest or gillet however you want to call it right really really well i think so a vest whatever they're called um but yeah everything in here is amazingly wearable man these the hood things these menacing hood things look at something that a character from dune would have worn are incredible i'm sure they're detachable um because obviously there's always a modular sort of element to what a cold war does i think this is the collaboration with the company roa or how you pronounce it Ro Ru, the kind of outdoor um boots there i love the sort of crump in there on the pants on the inside there's a couple of things here that i like of course the bag i'm a big fan of i think this might be the collaboration with east pack too this massive duffel bag thing which i'm a big fan of it's always nice when you have a brand that's able to make good shoppers bags and stuff for people that just like because I'm, I'm one of those dudes i like to carry stuff in bags i like to be mobile with my things like with stuff i don't know with a book with a you know um, with a computer with some maybe some equipment whatever it may be i like I, I just like to have shit on me i got massive bags i always have massive backpacks so when you have a brand with a designer that clearly likes to carry bags and books around with them too it's quite cool because it serves a good you know it's a good kind of entry point into those kind of brands because this will end up appealing to a lot of people especially if your store is sh it's stocked in department stores because you know you go to those department stores and you want a particular bag in particular size and you don't know where you want to get it from and then you see it when you see it you just want it and then as soon as you see it and you want it most likely if you like the bag you might like a jacket you might like a pair of pants you might like some shoes so it's a great way to kind of get people in um into the kind of um a cold war world um as it may be uh da -da -da, let's continue here of course presentation why it is always really well done there was a time in period why it felt like it felt like they were a bit too overindulgent like they were just being fussy and um I would say pretentious somewhat some would argue maybe a little bit pretentious but it feels like to me they've stuck by that way of presenting clothes and kind of intellectualizing it and now it's sort of making more sense does that make sense to you like before it kind of came across a bit pretentious but now because they've been doing it so consistently and the work has been good it's sort of starting to marry up it's kind of equivalent to remember when kanye was ranting about have you know not having access to factories and all this stuff and we didn't know what he was talking about like, well, what does that mean just make the shoes yourself right that whole like houseway houseway interview then when he finally starts to make the shoes in collaborations with adidas when it comes to easy and obviously you know i think the way not wave runners but the um, what you call it the 350s the yeezys whatever they may be they're probably basically one of the most like worn sneakers out there you obviously you always see people wearing those shoes doesn't matter who they are you, you then got to understand oh this is why he was banging on about production and manufacturing and having access to all these things because now he's able to make these shoes at a really high level and make them available to everybody and now everyone likes them because they're really good do you know what i mean it's that sort of thing so same sort of thing happened with them like 
it's over intellectual it was maybe a bit fussy a little bit up his own ass but now because the work is so good and the brand messaging and what they put out is so consistent it's now making sense like you hear the guy talk and everything makes sense because he's quite a deep guy i mean he's serious dude he takes his work very seriously clearly thinks about what he's doing you know a lot and it kind of shows in the work that they present everything makes sense it's not something that's just kind of plucked out of thin air from a flipping tumblr mood board or something or oh, this logo if this is a new way of presenting the logo i'm a fan i'm a fan i love a big back logo man this is this is like quintessential streetwear like a big black logo like a walking billboard like a sign like a calling card to people who other people who kind of fuck with the brand too like i love this shit i love massive logos honestly um in the same way that i love like random swear words on the back of like japanese brand clothing like from that neighborhood of double taps i love that shit man <laughs> look at this this is so good those boots are amazing isn't it? look at that colorway i think i mentioned in um in the tweet but i would love to see a collaboration in the same vein as these right between um what are they called mechanic is it me mechanic yeah mechanic gloves i would love to see something like this collaborated with flipping um a cold war i think it would go really well if they did something similar imagine right with gloves in silver however it may be done i know they did a collaboration with some accessories with oakley but i wonder if this is purposeful you don't really see them do collaborations with a lot of other people in terms of those kind of accessories and i wonder if that's a purpose and again i don't think the oakley's was even a cold war i think that might have been a samuel ross kind of side project he did on his own but i would like to see that because again imagine those silver gloves done in this way some way shape or form i think they would look great man really 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 good i think these are the ones that navy seals wear right but yeah these would look amazing if they did it in some way so maybe that's coming up soon who knows everyone's wearing gloves nowadays isn't it since kanye has kind of popularized the glove wearing i wonder if the whole glove wearing thing nowadays is sort of a weird subconscious thing trying to harken back to being a somewhat blue collar worker right or being somebody that has a craft that has um yeah that has that has a practice someone that goes to the studio every day and does things in a regimented way you wear the same clothes you put your gloves on you're ready to work. i wonder if that's the thing i don't know um but yeah you can, can't go another bomber jacket great shit all over man i love everything yeah, those hoods are sensational really really well done um again those gilet body vest things are one of the most underrated pieces that they do um it seems like they've also got uh a thing for always having great pockets on their jackets again things that i kind of notice that probably don't really make sense but they always seem to have great pockets on their jackets and coats and pants and stuff so it makes me think that a lot of these are meant to be functional You're meant to maybe stick a couple of books some headphones maybe a notepad or whatnot you know a book you're reading in these sort of things but yeah it looks all so so good man such a good week for streetwear with that news of rude getting that job and then obviously this collection coming out obviously the stuff we saw from matthew williams like everyone's really showing out man look at that denim the the denim um or the denim whatever suits pants that they do top and bottoms are always really good too as well they always have a good option of doing that way too so yeah these look absolutely phenomenal love everything about it and the great thing also i've seen that i've noticed about cold war most of the things that get shown are actually sold you know it's not like they show all these things and they don't get bought by the buyers like most of the stuff gets sold whether it's in store on their online store or sold at a department store or whatnot so that's always great to see man i'm not going to lie it's always great to see let's go back to actually collect let's see what the review actually said of it i didn't actually read let's quickly read that and then we can move on it says here yeah the real thought behind this collection was not to overanalyze interesting simon ross on zoom um in order to get into that zone ross switched up his usual design process of sketch to cad in favor of molding clay and plaster into maquettes um which he often colored with inks i wanted to find a real ex full expression that you could not necessarily find with a computer or a pair of scissors interesting he says that because this reminds me of something that rick owen said once about how he designs he doesn't sketch or draw he just drapes a lot of the stuff is done in shapes it's obviously done as in a refinement process i think even it's interesting everyone's happening in the same thing because i think even demna said it recently why would i just throw away or just start again from a from a, from scratch each collection why not take what i did in previous seasons and refine it and i think he even said one thing i think he mentioned he was talking to someone from his sales team i think demna said and he said that um how um a particular item didn't sell or something 
or maybe it had come back in vogue that didn't sell when it went came out the first time and instead of ditching it they tried to reiterate it again so basically he was doing the whole like you know what a tech startup would do or like a you know like a hardware company like an apple or whatnot would do where they'd get an iphone and basically try and refine it as much as they can over a period of time like iteration after iteration after iteration so maybe you know everyone's kind of feeling the same sort of vibe at the moment now so maybe this is this whole move that is going towards kind of more you know making things with your hands as opposed to just always doing stuff on the computer but it's cool to see man it says here it continues here the hyper analog um, starting point emerged from the exhibition of marble and steel sculpture furniture in last December's art Basel Miami which he added has definitely extended my creative process um, Ross applies to clothing metaphorical illustrations of the consequences of social physics the force of weight and energy exchange between centers of power and territories unempowered love it to create governments to help loosen the wearer's place in the world rather than to conform Le uh, literalish examples here include the shred the sheared arch leg trousers that he said reflected the load bearing elasticity of the lead um of lead sorry of lead right lead um the marble finish on the tactically pragmatic outwear and the pieces in over dyed canvas twill to which were applied in a linear pattern rendered by the compressing photographs of london new york milan and tokyo amazing oh i wonder if that means he's opening stores in these locations Hmm. Um, the appropriate uh, whatever that word is head shrouds were on a practical level Ross's response to the frustration with daily mask wearing huh interesting also a form of impractical um, sub subterfuge and category evasion as in other seasons copper wire wow man that's great I love that or oh, this should ask him if he's vaxxed or not <laughs> get really political um, as in other seasons copper wire edging and within the garment allowed the wearer to tweak his or her frame or fabric to his exact specifications I, I didn't know that was a detail actually interesting so in the around here or somewhere i'm assuming right so you could change how it looks on the bottom and whatnot um during our chat ross said that he thoughts during the making of his collection had run from classical civilization to the renaissance to the contemporary conservative government in the uk in an itinerary taking in two peaks and one trough by keeping these tides of thought in background as he sculpted his collection however ross shaped a portfolio of clothing whose ideological inspiration seemed at very most abstract its points of attraction meanwhile were manifestly concrete you know what i like about sammy ross now and the collection that they're doing now it feels like to me all of this really sort of like highbrow stuff this really hyper intellectualized way that he kind of looks at fashion is just supporting how good the clothes are before it felt like the and again maybe it's just it's just an unfortunate consequence of being black and being in fashion especially in the uk you kind of feel like you have to prove yourself and prove that you belong by showing off your intellectual side and maybe over complicating things just so you can prove no i belong here i'm as smart i'm as clued up i'm as knowledgeable as you are maybe even more and i'm going to prove it and maybe sometimes it can come off a bit you know a bit waspy a bit wanky or whatnot but that's what you just have to do unfortunately you, you know if you're someone that isn't indigenous from this country you always have to kind of perform at a way higher level than most people do just look at fucking boris johnson do you know what i mean do you think if you think if i was boris johnson or boris johnson was the same color as i that he would have that job come on man yeah so obviously maybe that was part of it now he's more confident obviously the funding the sales the community around the cold war they've got this massive facebook group that people seem to obviously love and share ideas on and connect and bloody blah 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 i think that's definitely allowed him to be a lot more I wouldn't say calm but whatever it is it just feels like the clothes are good and then all the intellectual stuff is like just isn't a great add-on because it, you get to enjoy the clothes a lot more because like oh there's loads of thought that went into it that, that pocket placement isn't random the way the, the way the jacket ends isn't random the bunching on this on the sleeves isn't random everything is kind of thought and considered but it's not just stuff made with thought and consideration just to make up for the lack of good clothing the clothes is actually good like legitimately good you see this stuff on the racks and you want to pick it up you want to think what, what the hell is that like how can i wear how can i wear this like ugh, so good everything's amazing love it all love it all love it all love it all um let's move on from that and let's talk about some other bits and pieces here before i leave you um what else you want to talk about 
Oh, let's talk about this. Yeah, have you seen this? This is quite hilarious, isn't it? This is courtesy of some guy on Twitter called Jacob Gallagher who posted this tweet. It said the following, in the month since Kanye wore these boots, they've appreciated 20 times. It's funny because when he first wore them, I was like, oh, they're quite cool. Let me search for them. I couldn't find them anywhere. But it's also funny because this reminds me of um, my small dilly, dilly dance or, you know, toe wiggle when it comes to setting trends in this way. Because usually when it comes to me, I've, I've kind of been known for always wearing massive boots, right? And there was a time period, I think even last year or the year before that, where I was wearing these boots. I was wearing these right well, I was wearing these New York boots every single day I'm showing the camera some New York boots that I purchased from eBay um, a few years ago right and I've been wearing these every single day during the entirety of lockdown when I was going out hanging around these have been my daily stompers and I noticed especially in the area that I live in a couple of dudes that basically saw me wearing them had suddenly got a pair themselves I was like oh that's funny isn't it because I've been wearing these every single day so maybe it was me maybe it was just a cultural site guys but you know it's a thing that you kind of notice and then out of nowhere, a few kind of months later, Kanye pops out and he's wearing these flipping massive Red Wing boots every single day. Or well, he's got this new kind of outfit, this new sort of like creative practice that he's got now where he's kind of wearing the same clothes all the time everywhere he goes. And the boots seem to be like a huge part of it. And it was pissing me off because I was thinking, oh man, I've been wearing these massive boots all the time. People are going to think now that I'm flipping, copying Kanye, going to go to New York boots. But to be fair, these are a lot more aggressive than these Red Wings. And he's wearing a lot of kind of like construction boots, sort of like um, waterproof sort of stuff that kind of looks conventionally, let's say normal. They look kind of easy to wear, even though these obviously are massive and they may be ugly to some people, but they're no different to a pair of biker boots. They're no different to a pair of Wellingtons. I mean, they look, they look that crazy, not that detached, but... I guess if you're going to wear a pair of New Rocks, you definitely have to be, you know, you definitely listen to techno if you wear these, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, th this is the, this is what real influence is about. This is what I mean. If you're actual, that's the problem. The issue with influence is now, it feels like, it feels like most people are just shilling brands that they don't even wear. So if a brand reaches out to you because you've got an amount of followers and they offer you the bag, they just take it and that's it you're not actually influencing it. Like even the people that do that food stuff, it's not as if they're like discovering new places. They're just going to the same places. They get given, you know, they get, get they get told to come to a press day. They get comped on a meal and that's it. You're not actually discovering little holes in the wall. You're not going to far flung places and, you know, maybe putting on whatever. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're just basically taking the deals that are coming inbound to you or reaching out to the places that are bait and popular. I don't think I've, for the longest time, maybe apart from, this blog called cheeseandbiscuits.blogspot.com or cheeseandbiscuits.com cheese and so it's n not and so cheese and biscuits definitely check it out it's probably the only sort of influencer kind of thing i've seen where this guy's a restaurant reviewer he never reveals his face or anything he takes pictures of him sometimes he gets conned but for the most part he goes to like random places around england and basically tries different restaurants and gives you a review and sometimes you'll find places that no one really has spoken about maybe he'll go to a place that everyone's raving about and won't like it but that's what influencing was before it was like going to places and basically discovering them you know and basically making them you know pop or whatever it may be but nowadays people don't do that so this is what actual room because what's going to happen with these that really is going to see the demand of these and they're going to release them that's what's going to happen or maybe Kanye's going to end up collaborating with them or maybe he's going to make his own iteration of them into Yeezys but this is definitely what influencing is because for sure Red Wing are receiving many emails about these shoes already at the moment and they're probably going to be like you know what this is leaving money on the table mate let's flip and take advantage of this shit let's get that Kanye rub and Kanye being Kanye is probably not going to accept any sort of you know tie in with that one's going to everyone to sit on the board or something of Red Wing you know Kanye so that he's not going to take any easy deal so they're definitely going to put these out they're definitely in, you know the, the sad thing is also the retro won't end up looking as good as this like the profile of this how flat it is like how bulky it looks it'll probably end up looking a lot more slimmer than this it'll probably end up being a lot shorter because it's just such a massive unit of a boot it may be I wonder if it's the same height as these wait what is it is it 17 centimeters it says here right what does it say? 17 inches. I don't know how big this is actually. Maybe it's the same. Maybe Or maybe it's higher. Uh, maybe it's higher because this comes up to my calf. But then, you know, I've got quite long legs. So maybe that's the part. But yeah, 
I wonder. But yeah, let's see, man. This is real influencing. Big up Kanye for the for the flipping Midas touch. He took these boots from being on sale and selling for one hundred and forty five dollars to now. At the last time that they sold on eBay, somebody was able to sell a pair of size thirteens for three thousand and fifty. The funny thing about it, if you notice Kanye wearing them up close pictures, they do look kind of big. And I remember back in the day, one of these guys who I knew in the sneaker community, I forgot who it was, sold, you should sell Kanye a few sneakers. And supposedly Kanye was really self-conscious about how small these actual feet are. So I think he's actually like a size eight or nine or something. I don't know whatever size it is, but he always wears like size 11s and 12s. That's what I've been told. He never wears shoes that are actually his size because he wants to appear to be a lot you know his shoes to be a lot bigger because i guess you know the whole bigger shoe thing means you got a bigger dick or something i don't know but it's a weird thing but i remember that being a thing so that might explain why the boots look so big in terms of the pro like side profile have you seen pictures of kind of wearing them they look really huge let me see if i can get another picture of him wearing them because i remember seeing a picture of him wearing it and he looked really they looked huge on him like ridiculously huge let's see i got this account i follow on twitter called photos of yay yay photo yay where is it that's the one right see if i get up on here yeah it's not oh yeah it's not, there's new pictures of him wearing the boots actually and about but it's not side profile he's got this cool shirt on but yeah you can't see a side profile but the side profile for sure they're a lot bigger than what they you know the this like they're not really his size do you know what i mean I, I i think so in my opinion i think they're a lot more longer than what his actual shoe size is but you know it's the hardest thing ever in the world to wear shoes that are longer than what your actual foot is like there's nothing worse than i think the only thing worse than wearing shoes that are too big or shoes that are too small the pain is intolerable but i've always had to keep do you know put up with it because my shoes my feet have always been big since i was young i was like i went from i remember being like a size seven to a nine to a ten straight away luckily i stopped at 10 now i'm like a 10 10 and a half but you know imagine being 16 and everyone in your school is flipping size seven and able to get cheap shoes and you're a legit man size 10 you know what I mean it was always embarrassing so I'd always kind of purposely wear smaller shoes and then take out the insole and stuff and oh my feet I killed my feet for a long time when I was younger man and then obviously when I got older I just embraced the fact that I got big feet and obviously I grew a bit taller as well so it kind of made up for it but yeah that was a big deal for a long time um let's see is there any other example I've actually got this I've got, I've got this book actually I need to do a little thing on this book too but yeah if you can see the boots do look a little bit bigger for a minute they don't look exactly his size maybe I'm reading into it too much but uh, yeah don't don't be surprised if these boots end up coming out retail because you know he's he, he has made these guys he's kind of uh I'm sure spiked the Google Analytics when it comes to um them putting out those shoes I'm pretty sure but yeah that is going to be it for now i think yeah that may be it i've already been blabbering on for ages anyway thanks again for tuning in oops let me take this oh the thing was on the whole time annoying anyway thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual um if this is your first time watching the show then thank you if it's your second time thank you if it's your first time thank you um obviously cheers and all that good stuff if you can leave me a review if you're listening via spotify that'd be greatly appreciated if you're watching via youtube leave me a like obviously leave your comment down below and i'll see you guys again very soon again patreon episode coming out very soon sit tight for that one it's coming out should be on thursday if you check that out if you're not already subscribed check get involved already link is in the description everything you need to know is there it's only one pound equivalent of one dollar get involved on delay and i'll see you guys again very very soon until then take care peace